Hey everybody, welcome to the final lesson, lesson number 13 in this Bible study series that we've been calling Solomon Building with Wisdom. This has been a study of First and Second Chronicles and today uh, we will be in Second Chronicles chapter 9 and we'll be wrapping up this study. Uh, you'll need your Bibles or your Bible apps open to Second Chronicles chapter 9. You're also going to want to have the listening guide that we have for this lesson and you'll find that the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and, and click on that, uh, download that listening guide, print it out. There are some blanks for you to fill in during the lesson portion and much more important than that though, there are some discussion questions there for you to uh, press these truths back and forth into one another in your small group. And so I hope you're doing that with your small group as well. So before we jump into this lesson, let's pray, shall we? Father, we just so adore your word and we love the place that it holds in our lives. We love the wisdom that it holds for us. Um, we love the fact that um, for thousands of years it has held true and been found true by literally billions of people. And so our prayer today, Lord, is that as we open your word, you will open our hearts and you'll pour into them and you'll change us. You'll change how we see the world around us. We cha you'll, you'll change uh, how, how we understand you and how we understand ourselves. Uh, teach us your ways, Father. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today's lesson is actually part two of a lesson of a two-part lesson. Uh, the, the last two lessons in this series is a two-part lesson uh, that I'm calling Stewarding Success. And we talked last week in, in part one uh, about really what we're talking about there, where that comes from. Um, it comes from the idea that uh, while, uh, while the wisdom of this world has been good at helping us know how to leverage our failures and learn from our mistakes, so to speak, failing forward, if you will, uh, the, the wisdom of this world doesn't really tell us all that much about how to steward our successes, how to learn better from our successes and how to take our successes and leverage them. And uh, God's Word does, though. God's Word does. And, and through the lesson of Solomon and Solomon's life and the success that he had in building the temple, there is much for us to learn in terms of how we can leverage that success, how we should be stewarding that success. Now, in last week's lesson, we talked about uh, stewarding our successes in terms of our relationships with other people. We looked at the, the visit from the Queen of Sheba to Solomon last week and, and how that relationship, uh, Solomon successfully stewarded um, his success in order to, uh, to, to help point to God in the life of Sheba. Uh, and that was a really important thing. But this week's lesson uh, is almost a negative lesson because uh, we're, we're going to be looking this week about what about stewarding our success in terms of our own uh, relationship with God and our own um, how, how we see ourselves and how we see the world around us. And uh, Stu uh, Solomon not, didn't do so well with that. And there are some lessons for us to learn in terms of, of how Solomon's relationship with the Lord as a result of his wealth and success uh, how his relationship with the Lord began to erode and he began to fade, uh, that, that love for the Lord and that, and that ob obedience to God began to fade. And, and there are some lessons for us to learn from that as well. And so stewarding, stewarding our success for our own spiritual good and for also for future generations is what we'll be looking at today. Uh, we're going to be starting with verse 13 in Second Chronicles chapter 9. And let's just read the first few verses and see where this takes us. Verse 13. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. That is literally tons, several tons of gold a year, besides that which the explorers and merchants brought. And all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon. And King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went into each of those shields. And he made 300 shields, smaller shields of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went into each of those shields. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. That's his palace. He just kept them in his palace. And, and stop there and recognize that those shields wouldn't have been good for anything else. They certainly wouldn't have been any good in warfare. They'd have been way too heavy in warfare, and they would have been way too soft. 
made of pure gold. For, for, so they were nothing but ornamental shields. That was what he was relegated to using his gold for, was building ornamental things. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps and a footstool of gold, which were attached to the throne, and on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. These were sculptures of lions. While 12 lions stood there, one on each side of a step on the six steps leading up to the throne. Nothing like it was ever made for any kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every, once every three years, the ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Bottom line here is King Solomon and the nation of Israel, they were filthy rich. I mean, when, when, when God blessed Solomon with both wisdom and wealth, God said to him, you will have both wisdom and wealth unlike any king has ever had or ever will have in this world. And so it truly is uh, a, a high water mark in terms of worldly kings and their wealth. By the world's standards, by the world's standards, this would have been the very pinnacle of success, everything that success looks like. Uh, the question this raises, though, and you know the question we're going to be asking here because we're talking about stewarding our success, the question it, it asks is, was he properly stewarding his wealth? Was he properly using his wealth in order to point to God? Uh, I will tell you that um, th this is a question that I think we all often ask when we see a picture of just overwhelming, over-the-top wealth, when we see a picture of that, the question that always comes to all of our minds is, is that person really a good person or not? Uh, and, and, and we're probably pretty skeptical about what, what that person's wealth has done to them and made them a bad person. I, uh, the wealthiest person I have ever been in the same room with uh, said, uh, wealth just makes you more of what you already were. And so wealth doesn't make you a good person, and it certainly doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you more of what you already were. And the reason for that is because the wealth gives you the opportunity of fulfilling whatever your desires are. And your desires, our desires, are what make us a good person or a bad person. And so when we have the opportunity to fulfill those desires, we just become more and more and more of what we were already leaning towards. It all really does boil down to an issue then of stewardship. Uh, uh, with regard to our resources, with regard to our treasures and our wealth, are we leveraging those? Are we using those resources as stewards? In other words, are we treating those resources as if they belong to us and we get to use them for whatever we want, or are we treating all of those resources as if they belong, all of them belong to God, and we are going to use them in the way He wants us to use them? Because that's what stewardship means. Being a steward means fulfilling the desires, fulfilling the wishes of the person you are a steward for. Uh, and so if, if, if you give me uh, signing authority on all of your bank accounts and ask me to be a steward for your for for you then I am I am obligated then to use your money in the ways that you would want to use it all I'm doing is rubber stamping and writing the checks the ways you would want me to use them that's what being a steward would mean so uh, when we talk about our wealth and our treasure and our resources it really does mean that we are using all of them all of them in the way that God wants them. And a trick question here in those of us who've been raised in, for those of us who've been raised in the church is, what percentage of your resources does God want? And that's a trick question because we're inclined to use the tithe and say, well, he wants 10%, but no, he wants, he cares about all, 100%. He wants 100% of our resources. He wants us to use 100% of everything that we have in the ways that he desires us to use it uh, because he loves us and because he can see so much more than we can see and know so much more than we can know he's all-knowing and all-loving he knows what's best 
He knows what's best for His glory and for our good. And so He cares about all of it. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank on your listening guide. For the Christ follower, all of our worldly possessions, whether great or small, belong to God. All of them. Stewardship means God cares equally about how we use every single bit of our resources, not just the portions we give to the church. He cares about all of it, and it matters to Him. He matters to Him how we use all of it because it all belongs to Him. Let's keep reading, though, in verse 22. It says, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present, articles of silver and of gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, mules, so much year by year. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. The chronicler is just wanting to remind, hundreds of years after all of this happened, the chronicler wrote this down as the people of Israel were coming out of exile back to Jerusalem. And the chronicler was just wanting to remind the people of Israel of what an amazing, great nation they are. And he wanted to remind them of their heritage. And that's why he's, he's going to the trouble to lay out all of this wealth that, that Solomon had. Uh, but Solomon's success was, was about so much more than just wealth, right? It was about his, this wisdom. It was about his entire economy. It was about everything, that all the infrastructure that he had put in place. His wisdom was astounding, and it caused him to excel above all the kings of the earth. He had power. He had influence that resulted from his God-given wisdom. Uh, the bottom line is he had ultimate, what we would call, celebrity status. And, and, and in some ways, in our current culture, I do think that in our current culture, we are obsessed with wealth. And there's no question in my mind about that. But, but it seems to me that we may be even more obsessed with celebrity than we are with wealth. Uh, that by that, I mean we're more obsessed with social media influencers. And I mean, we have people in our culture who are, uh, who are literally famous just for being famous. I mean, there's nothing they've ever done or accomplished that would merit that other than that they ended up being famous for some weird reason. And now we look to them we, we, for, for, for wisdom and for what they think about this. We care about what they think about important social issues just because they are celebrity status. We are obsessed with celebrity status in our culture. And, and so way more than wealth, I think, in our culture, this has become an obsession for us. And so how does Solomon end up stewarding that celebrity status? That's the question. As we gain influence, as we gain power or influence in our culture, uh, stewardship becomes an issue, becomes a question. How are we stewarding that influence and that power that came from God, that, that the, the blessings that God permitted into our lives. How are we stewarding that influence for His glory? It matters how we use that influence and what we do with the glory that comes with it. Do we keep the glory for ourselves or do we redirect that glory to the God who made this all possible in the first place? If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement now on your listening guide. As a Christ follower, any power or influence I am blessed to have belongs to God and should be used for His glory, not mine. We probably do not talk enough about stewarding our success in that regard. The problem, though, for Solomon is, though he got it right and he did properly steward his success up to a point, there was apparently a point in his reign, in his 40 years of reign as king, when the, the candle began to go out, the, 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 the flame, the fire for God in his heart began to dissipate. He began to distance himself more and more from God. He began to turn from God and allow uh, the, the blessings in his life to begin actually to distract him from God. The, the desires of his heart were not for all things godly. Uh, they ended up being for some other kinds of things, beginning with verse 26. And he ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamores of the Shephelah. 
and horses. And, and look at this verse 28. This is such an important verse. This, this is a, a hidden signal from the chronicler that not all things were well. And I'll explain that in a second. Verse 28 says, And horses were imported for Solomon from Egypt and from all lands. The chronicler was certainly truthful in how he portrayed Solomon in this regard, but like the media sometimes in our own culture, he didn't tell the whole truth. He didn't necessarily tell the entire picture because his objective, the chronicler's objective here, was to encourage the people of Israel, not to discourage them. So he didn't tell the negative sides of King David and of King Solomon when he was writing these stories. But if you go back and look in 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 1 Kings and in, in other places in Scripture, you see that negative side, and you see in Solomon's case how he actually turned, and there's just a little hint in verse 28, a little hint of that negative side when it says, and horses were imported for Solomon from Egypt. Why is that a negative trace? Well, because if you look back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, at a time when the people of Israel were just getting ready to move into the Promised Land, and Moses was was re-summarizing all of the law for them. Here's what you need to read. This is kind of like uh, a mother's screen door talk with, the, with their kid before they send them outside to play. Now, don't forget to do this, and don't forget to do that, and remember this, keeping them safe. This was Solomon having that kind of a talk. I mean, uh, excuse me, Moses having that kind of talk with the people of Israel. Listen to what he said. Among all the things he, he, he said and taught them right before they entered the Promised Land, listen to what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Beginning in verse 14, he's talking about, and, you, and if you ever decide to have kings, here's what you need to know. This is, in, this is in verse 14 of Deuteronomy 17. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell it, and then say to yourself, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But listen to what he says about that king. This is in verse 16 of Deuteronomy 17. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire those horses. So strike one for Solomon right there. And the chronicler clearly pointed that out to us, that he was going back to Egypt to get these horses, exactly what God said he should not do. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. But listen, he goes on. Moses goes on. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Guess what? Strike two for Solomon. That's exactly what Solomon did. 700 wives he acquired for himself, many of which were from outside the Hebrew faith. And then lastly, he says, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Silver was so excessive, it was worth, it was like stones. Gold was so excessive, he was using it to cover things that otherwise would have been beautiful without it, like an ivory throne. So, so Solomon, strike three, he, Solomon did everything. Solomon ended up doing with his with his success, everything that God warned the people of Israel that their king should not do. Clearly, he was eventually not stewarding his success in the way that he needed to. He ended up breaking every rule God gave for the king. He did not love God with all his heart. We know that. We know that his heart began to turn, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, the Shema, uh, that the, the we should love the Lord our God with, in that way. That, that clearly, his heart was beginning to distance from the Lord. And obedience is the way we love God. Obedience is what that looks like. What does it look like to love God? Scripture is real clear. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said. That's how we demonstrate our love. It's also how we experience God's manifest presence is through our obedience. Every act of obedience brings a little bit more experience of God. And so we tend, we tend to uh, get more obedience, unfortunately, in our, in our way of life, in the human condition. We tend to be more obedient when we've failed than we are when we succeed. And why is that? Because when we fail, we realize, oh, we need God. I need God. And so we go back to God. There is this, there is this cycle that the, the book of Judges, which we'll be looking at next is in our next study, there is this cycle of, of the human condition of 
walking with God and then beginning to drift away from God because things are going pretty good. And I think, I got this, God. I can do this on my own. I don't need to obey you so much. And all of a sudden, I'm not obeying God. And then bad things begin to happen to me. And up on that upward cycle, I begin to cry out to God again and say, God, I messed up. I'm so sorry. I repent. And I get back in right step in right stead with him. And, and then I repeat the cycle over and over and over again. That's what Solomon was doing. He he got to a point in his, in his blessings and his success where he felt like, I've got this, God. I can do this without you. I don't need you. I've got everything I need here. I don't need you anymore. And when we do that, we, make, we begin to make bad choices. Uh, our success with God should actually call us to an even greater obedience. That's what God wants. What stewarding, stewarding our success means is that every time... Every time we feel like we've succeeded in something, it, it should call us to an even greater obedience to God. That's what Solomon did not ultimately do, but what we should do. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third blank on your listening guide. We tend to get more, much more obedient to God when we are struggling, less so when things are going well. But when God grants us success, it is a call to even greater and higher obedience, not less. To whom much has been given. To whom much has been given. So let's wrap this up, beginning in verse 29. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon from first to last, are they not written in the history of Nathan the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shelonite, and in the, in the visions of Iddo the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. So that's the way the chronicler wraps this up. And I said earlier that the chronicler didn't tell us everything. He just told us the positive things because he wanted the people of Israel to be encouraged as they came out of exile. Well, what is the rest of the story? Well, if you look back at 1 Kings, you can read the rest of the story. This is what it sounds like in 1 Kings beginning in chapter 11, verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonite, Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn, your, turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, and was as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. And because of this, God became angry with Solomon. Because of these choices on Solomon's part, God brought about the beginning of the end for the nation of Israel, and they would be taken into exile by the Babylonian Empire. As a result of all these things, the nation was going to be divided. Solomon was the last king to rule over a unified Israel. Uh, God said to Solomon, I'm going to take away most of Israel from you, and there's going to be a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and all you're going to be left with, you and your sons, is, is, is the, the, the tribe of Judah and Jerusalem, and everyone else will be split. The nation will be split. And so this was definitely sh uh, shining a light on Solomon's failures and on the importance of properly stewarding our success when God gives us success. It makes a difference. It doesn't just make a difference in our life. It makes a difference for generations to come when we properly steward or fail to properly steward our success. It affects the future generations as well. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the fourth statement on your listening guide. Bouncing back from failure makes a difference in our lifetime, but properly or improperly stewarding our success makes a difference for generations to come. 
That's what stewarding our success looks like. It means using all of our resources as God sees fit, not just a portion of them, but all of them. It means using all of our power and influence as God sees fit. It means that the more successful we become, the higher the expectations are of our obedience to God. And lastly, it means that it will make a difference. How we handle our success will make a difference, either positive or negative, for generations to come. And so it matters how we steward our success, our obedience to God. This is what stewarding our success looks like when we look inwardly at our relationship with God as opposed to our relationships with others. And that is stewarding our success. And it's also the end of this really rich study on building with wisdom. I hope you've enjoyed this study as much as I have. This has been a wonderful study. We're going to pick up with a brand new study next week in the book of Judges. I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to that. It'll be focused on God as our deliverer. And uh, I'm really excited about that. So in the meantime, I hope you guys have a blessed week. I love you guys. And we'll see you right here next week.